Hello everybody, I'm Nick, and in this video I want to talk about the underrated keyword that you probably did not know that C Sharp has. In fact, I can almost guarantee that the vast majority of you don't know that this exists, and if you did know it, please leave a comment down below, and that is the go-to keyword. Now, I know, I know, whenever you hear the words go-to keyword, many of you, especially if you know the keyword from C, for example, would go, oh my god, what are you talking about? Why do we have to go so many years backwards and use something that we've replaced with other constructs in our modern programming languages? But in this video, I want to present the keyword to you just so you know it exists and also show a case where I think the keyword reads better than the alternative. Of course, this is not a video advocating for you to use the go-to keyword everywhere. Do not take it as that. This is just a presentation of the feature and the presentation of a use case that I personally prefer. You don't have to prefer it. This is just my opinion. If you like that of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe and for more training, check out my courses on dontrain.com. Okay, let me show you what I have here and let me just present you the use case. And the way I'm going to present you the use case is by first showing you how you would do it without the go-to keyword. So what I have here is a weather API, just a bog standard weather API. And it's actually from a different video. It's from a video where I show decoration. And all we're really doing here is we're calling for the weather and we use the open weather map API to get the actual weather. We do an API call to get the weather and then we return it through our own API. So we just forward that call in a way. Now, because this is an HTTP call to another third party API, we do want to have some resilience. And to add some resilience, the simplest way is to actually add a retry policy for transient errors. Now, you could do this with libraries like Poly, for example, but in this video, I'm going to show you how you can do this manually to present the feature. So what we have here is a resilient weather service that is decorating our actual course. If you need more background in terms of why we're doing this, I do recommend you check out my decoration video. I'm going to put a link in the description, but that's for later. And all I want to do here is say that retry for a certain amount of times and wait for a second between retries if this thing throws an exception. Now, realistically, I would also narrow the exceptions to make sure that they are transient errors that can be retried. But for the purposes of this video, I'm not going to do that. So how would you do this in the traditional sense? Well, this is actually something that in my mind feels very hacky when I do it the normal way. But I'm going to show you how you really would do this. So first, we're going to have a retries count to keep track of how many times we've retried. And let's say we have five retries we want to make. And then what we would do is usually we would have a while loop that says while true. So an infinite while loop. Then we would introduce our try and our catch. In this case, the catch will just catch anything. So we're just going to ignore it. You could say exception to be more specific. You don't have to do it because we won't do anything with that exception. Now in the try, all you want to say is, hey, return that call. So we're going to make that API call. In the catch, there's a few ways you can deal with this. Some will say that this is cleaner, so they will prefer the if minus minus retries equals zero. So when you exhaust your retries and you're going to decrease them before the check, then throw the exception and break the flow. Otherwise, just await for task.delay for one second and go again, basically loop around again. Now, I don't prefer this because it adds two things in a single line that I have to calculate. So it's basically when retries are zero, but also minus minus, but it's just a bit weird to me. So I personally prefer the retries minus minus, and then I have my check and that I prefer. Now, I personally do not like the way this whole method reads. So I have my retries up there to keep track of them. Then I have this infinite while true loop, which I don't like seeing personally because then I have to keep track of what can break out of the loop. And in this case, it's the return statement over here or this throw. It could also be a break as well or a continue if you want to skip an iteration and so on. But all of these things are possible. And then I have my checks to see if I have enough retries or not. Now, there's nothing wrong with this, but I just personally never like the way it read. Whenever I had to write retries like this, my brain always hurt. So let's go ahead and change this a bit. So what I'm going to do is remove everything but the return over here and the delay. And now I want to introduce go to. Now there's two things you need to know about go to. First, the go to keyword is used and then a label is used. A label might be something you've never seen before, but you can label a specific point in your code to say this thing has a name. This location over here has a name and I can go to that name. So if I want to do the same thing now using the go to, 
first I would have to keep track of how many retries I have. So I can say retry count equals zero. So I've basically retried for zero times at this point. Then I want to label this line over here as the start of my operation. And all I do is I give it any name and then a colon. And that is it. Now this is a label. And you can see label start is not referenced because I'm not actually using it anywhere. Then I want to go into the catch section. So I'm going to say if retry count less or equals to four, then retry count plus plus, so increase retry count, then move this await line here, so wait for one second, and then go to the start label. Otherwise, just throw. And that is it. And in my opinion, this does read better because it reads more, like, in my mind anyway, one way linearly so we start here we have the label with the anchoring point and then we go okay if this works fine if not check do we have enough retries left if we do then go to the start if not just throw the exception there's no loop to keep track of even though there technically is a loop i feel that this reads better however the biggest problem with having a go to keyword is that the label can be anywhere you can skip forwards or backwards in any direction break from loops go into loops go into whatever you want and that is usually the biggest criticism with go to because it gives you so much freedom that you can do whatever you want and people tend to do stupid shit when you give them freedom in this scenario however where everything is very condensed and you can see the whole flow into a single page that i think is a valid use case for using the keyword if you think that this reads better and in my opinion it does. It's easier to write for me and it's easier to read for me. The concern I would have using this is that someone starts here and of course you see the label first, so that's good. But then you kind of have to find the go-to keyword to see where it is and then return back. But if the method is written well, then it's not a problem. In fact, the .NET Runtime and SDK heavily use the go-to keyword for different things like the convert base 64 conversion, a link is using it, a bunch of different things are using it just because of how easy it can make some things that otherwise would be very hard to write with loops and if statements and a bunch of different hoops you have to jump to basically have the exact same experience. And yes, another thing you can do with the go-to keyword is actually go to a different case while you are in a switch. So if you're in a specific case, for example, initialized and you're going to go into case begin event without having to reiterate or recall something, then you can say go to case and you can go to a different case in switch which you can see how this can also be problematic, and I'm not saying you should do that, but it's a very, very powerful keyword, and I, and I quite like the freedom. I don't know if other people looking at my code would like that freedom, but this is certainly something that could be used, in my opinion, in some use cases. Now, you might be wondering, how does this perform and compare with a normal for loop, for example? And I have you covered. So let me show you what I have here. I have this benchmark class over here. We're using benchmark.net, and I have 100 iterations of a for loop that is iterating over and over again and then it's adding the value of i into account and then I have the exact same thing with go to. So let's see how a for loop compares to a go to loop. I'm going to go ahead here and run this benchmark in release mode and see what we have at the end. Okay, so results are back and let's see what we have here. So as you can see, go to and for loop basically perform the exact same. 24.9 or 0.86 nanoseconds go to is a bit faster but in reality they're exactly the same so you don't really have to worry about any performance concerns go to as you can probably imagine is very fast the only thing you really have to worry about is how much damage this keyword can do to your code in the hands of someone who doesn't really use it in a good way as with anything this is just a tool and i do think it has a place but you have to be very very careful but now i want to know from you have you used the go to keyword did you know it exists and what's your favorite use case for it leave a comment down below and let me know well that's all i have for you for today thank you very much for watching and as always keep coding